Great. Thank you, Josh. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to our presentation this morning. Um, I'm Vanessa Cam, head librarian at the Bose Art and Architecture Library at Stanford. And I'm Frank Floyd, art media technologist in the Department of Art and Art History at Stanford. Over the last three years, we worked with Emanuele Lully, assistant professor in the Department of Art and Art History at Stanford on implementing Mirador 3.0.0, a IIIF viewer in an art history course classroom. This 15 minute talk titled, Here It's Just You and the Art, Pure Experience, Mirador in an Art History Classroom will focus on this current use case. Now about the course, the course is required for all undergraduate art history majors and is titled Methods and Historiography of Art History. It focuses on key perspectives in the discipline of art history as illustrated through case studies. One very pertinent aspect of the course is that it takes a careful look at how technology has been used in art historical pedagogy through the ages. The trajectory of technology used in the art history classroom for presenting and studying images actually started with engravings in large books, uh, as well as copies of paintings and plaster casts, and then with the invention of photography and the availability of lantern slides in the late 19th century. Um, they use lantern slides, printed images mounted on boards, or sometimes photographs mounted on boards. Um, there's also when the introduction of the 35 millimeter slide and slide carousel came, it was kind of revolutionary as far as, as projecting images in the classroom um, to the reliance on digital images, for example, TIFF files. And finally, uh, to using this specific instance of the web-based Mirador viewer available at projectmirador.org. So for those of you who know Mirador, um, which is you know, a great viewer for comparison and annotation, um, let's, let's go through a brief bit of the class's timeline. Um, and, and we should quickly mention that Professor Lully began at Stanford in 2018 and brought his zeal for using Mirador in the classroom into the department. The goal has been twofold. On the one hand, Professor Lully wanted students to engage with a pedagogical tool that was still very much in development so as to invigorate students' critical attitudes. And this is completely in alignment with the fact that Stanford is located in the heart of Silicon Valley, um, which as you know, is, is constantly trying to push the envelope and do innovative things. So on the other hand, as Mirador could be paired with Zoom, it allowed students to take control of the class display. They could choose, <clears throat> excuse me, what portions of the images on which to focus and bring in additional images for immediate comparison. The slide here shows the, the evolution um, that the professor had um, as moderator to a much more egalitarian and spontaneous discussion, a more round table class kind of atmosphere. The students thus were in charge of the directions that the class discussions took rather than you know, kind of passively accepting the decisions preemptively taken by the professor. And, and that students could very interactively steer the narrative flow. So while Professor Lu Li in 2021 was teaching in a very modern way, utilizing Mirador 3 released in 2020 with a robust projection setup, the students in the course were analyzing individually and as a lineage, the methods of presenting images in the art history classroom. So we'll assume everyone has seen Mirador in action, but suffice it to say, there's a lot of interactive functionality now, Mirador could potentially expand into many classrooms focused on a variety of disciplines, but for us, it made perfect sense to start with this course with its focus on the use of technology for teaching art history. It allowed us to reflect on the challenges, benefits, and limitations of this technology, knowing, of course, that other technologies for showing images also have benefits and challenges. 
For example, reproductions in books where the original work is lost, 35 millimeter slides where colors can fade or the surface gets scratched, to digitized files which may not be sustainable depending on the format in which they are held. So um, I uh, will talk, that was the class itself in the structure, but I will talk about the student experience. Um, from the start, Professor Luli uh, asked each student to keep a weekly journal through which to track their relationship uh, in using Mirador. And uh, over the 20 classes, um, they experimented with the, you know, scaling, zoom in and out functionality, uh, importing files from various institutions and uh, comparing versions of the same artwork, say in different phases of restoration or reproduction. They worked with triple IF resources as well as other formats. So to best uh, really push the boundaries of the platform and test them. And, uh, for the final assignments, students were asked to su submit that diary. Um, they were instructed to write candidly about Mirador and present their personal reflections uh, and critiques to the Mirador development team here at Stanford. Um, their critiques were expansive. Uh, students were also invited to share their thoughts on working with IIIF images in general and how the use of digital reproductions of art uh, shapes their perception and analysis of visual art and architecture. Um, so uh, what we have now is a section of their feedback in their own words. Um, uh, I want to uh, maybe may let you read this, um, you know, their quotes, and then I'll, uh, you know, summarize a few points as we go through. I'll move on. And the next slide. So uh, there were some common threads. Uh, we had, you know, it was a group of about 15 students in each class in the two years, uh, 2019 and, and 2021. And um, if you think about the tools that we have uh, of the day, the typical ones, you know, just showing presenting slides in a classroom, there was a lot of added functionality, but students I think saw um, limits as well as freedoms, you know, uh, it's one thing to be able to scale, but it's they were having this conversation about, well, it almost seems restrictive if you can only see it from one point of view, or if you can only have a um, only go so far in your in your scaling, et cetera. It's it's not uh, exactly a transparent reflection of a real life interaction with an artwork. Um, and it's great that they were having these conversations, but it was also, I think, interesting um, and informative for the development team to sort of uh, push them to go farther.
And again, uh, if, if you could think about the, the white cube analogy of the gallery uh, space, uh, you know, sometimes the students, I think, were expressing their frustration either with it seeming like an institutional, you know, um, maybe bias um, in the interface, uh, which I, I think is um, not where Mirador was coming from, but I think uh, that was the inference that these restrictions tended to seem like, well, if, what is the motivation behind them? Why can't I really, you know, just sort of do anything with the images? Um, so there is, I think, room for improvement. And then uh, besides those conversations that were overarching and, and you know, um, really broad, uh, they did have a lot of specific feedback, which the Mirador team took to heart, you know, things like changing, being able to change the background color, because as you look at art, you know, that can affect the, the piece, not just the simple gray background. Uh, having a, a way to fine tune the adjustments for zooming, because maybe you want to go between 24 and 27 percent slowly, as opposed to just, you know, static 5, 10, 15. Um, and, uh, and being able to save, it was great that they were able to annotate. Again, this is a feature that's not really seen in a lot of other programs for presentation, but, uh, but then they wanted to save them and, and you know, present them later, uh, say, in a lecture or uh, their own class presentations. And, and, there, and the list went on. And then just a, a, a summary, um, we did, you know, we were tasked in 2019 first to integrate uh, Mirador into the classroom and it was successful. And, and because it was uh, even earlier, uh, a big part of that was giving that feedback, um, which continued. So uh, we were very happy about that. The students did a great job and I think kudos, you know, go all around. Um, and I think it is an interesting uh, uh, parallel for uh, things like Zoom uh, because there is more and more development happening. You know, these things are changing in, in the last, you know, like three years or so, uh, quite a bit. So I think there's also the future of Mirador on the horizon, like what's next? And I think because, like I said, we gave all that feedback to the team, uh, I think exciting things are in store. Um, they're going to they're going to really push the Mirador platform forward. Um, and uh, and lastly, I think there's definitely an elephant in the room, you know, because of the pandemic, when we did this in 2019, uh, no one was using Zoom in a classroom setting to to a large you know degree. Uh, we did it because of that interactivity, being able to control the, you know, another person's screen was a useful thing and everyone had a laptop. And then all of a sudden, pretty much all of uh, higher education uh, went to a remote teaching or hybrid platform, integrated Zoom or a program like it into their classes. And so now I think it's going to be very interesting to watch the parallel uh, development uh, between Zoom and programs like Mirador and how they stay within the classroom environment in the future. So thank you everyone. And here are our names and emails should you wish to continue the conversation with us. And finally, we'd just like to uh, give a shout out. Um, thank you to, um, sorry, I just need to look at my notes quickly. Um, yes, so shout outs to Emanuele Luli, Assistant Professor of Art History in the Department of Art and, and Art, His Art History uh, at Stanford. Mark Matienzo, Assistant Director for Digital Strategy and Access in the Digital Library Systems and Services Unit of Stanford Libraries. And last but not least, Kenji Ikemoto, Academic Technology Specialist at the Center for Teaching and Learning at Stanford. So I think we've got about five minutes for questions since we're supposed to wrap total time at 20 minutes. So um, would anybody, does anyone have questions? Yeah, that, that's great. Thank you um, to Vanessa and Frank. Um, really interesting stuff and, and really intersects with what I think a lot of parts of the community are looking at is, you know, now, now that the technology is mature, how do we actually incorporate, you know, some of the theory, some of the UX, some of the other really important pieces that come into it. And you're right, we have uh, about five minutes for questions. I think we run till 10 after the hour. Um, there are a few 
questions and comments in the chat. I'll just read a few and maybe you can react to those. Um, one question is, uh, were students able to use the annotation tools in Mirador? Um, and another question was, did the class look at sculpture and architecture or only painting? Um, Im images of sculpture and architecture require some sort of contextualization, but paintings may not. We'll I, yeah, I, I can speak to that, Vanessa. Um, I, as far as the um, uh, architecture, uh, there was there there were twenty classes, and um, I think more than uh, or about half of them really focused on Mirador in terms of the students presenting in class or having the discussion using Mirador. Uh, you know, like like basing a class discussion around uh, being able to manipulate the art. And uh, I know uh, at least one, if not uh, several of those classes dealt with maps. Um, we have a, a map center that is quite robust at Stanford, the uh, David Rumsey Map Center. And so they had a, uh, in 2019, they had a visit over there and used it on site. And in 2021, it was remote, but the, the lesson was still there. Um, and they did look at sculpture. You know, again, that's, I think, what they were reacting to was to look at a sculpture means you have to look at someone's scan of that artwork. So when you scan a painting, you know, there's sort of like, okay, we'll look at it. Um, you know, uh, um, the perspective will be straight on and the lighting will be so. So there are those choices that are made by the institution and those were tangible. You know, the students sort of wanted to say, hey, this is not exactly like a real world experience because I could go at noon, I could go in the evening, you know, I could um, see it in a sort of more personal way. And that was amplified with sculpture um, because the scans of the sculpture are, you know, you, you have multiple versions, but Mirador, I don't think lets you sort of twist or turn and, and manipulate it in 3D. So you're looking at a series of 2D stills. Um, and I'm trying to remember, what was the first question? The uh, annotations, did they oh, yes. use this? And they, yes, they did definitely use the annotations, um, I think because they were um, starting off with it and, and more focused on the discussion, they didn't um, you know, really take a deep dive into the annotations. But I know that, again, that was one of the feedback points was that they liked the annotations and could circle or, or write something on there, but they wanted to do that, quit Mirador, you know, like get out of the, the, the um, interface and then go back two days later and record those annotations. And I think that feature hasn't been implemented yet. So they did use it, but they wanted to, to be pushed further. That's, that's great. Um, thank you. And, and I see there's a couple more coming in and we won't have time to cover all these in session right now, but maybe one last one in the last minute here. Um, there's a question asking, could you say more about the students comment on uh, quote unquote poor images? Uh, what do you think about this point in the context of Mirador and digitization in general? So uh, I think that the, what's interesting about this is how um, critical theory um, by scholars like Hito Sterl, um, super influential scholar, right? Um, is really, really impacting how students um, look at things, how, you know, instruments for viewing images, say in a classroom or elsewhere. Um, so I think that, you know, they paid a lot of attention to the critique around, you know, no, no Mirador for poor images, uh, Mirador for, you know, really shiny, high res uh, institutionalized images. But what about, you know, images that you find elsewhere in the world that are, you know, still impactful on your sort of visual environment. There's no, there's no viewer specifically for them. Um, but, but again, I do think that, you know, um, theory, sort of critical theory, literary theory really does kind of in, influence how students are looking at images and how they're taking them apart. Yeah, and I think to add to, I, I think the students in their words, they said there's a sort of fetishism of the close up view. You know, there's certain things that arise out of the platform, a platform like Mirador, because what features do you have and what does it accentuate? And what it accentuates is this, it accentuates is this close up view or this certain, certain form of intimacy. And it sort of throws out maybe others, like why would you um, uh, 
have a disregard for a poorly low res image, you know, a poorly pixelated low res image. I think a lot of people do like that. And Mirador sort of casts those aside because, um, you know, it's, it's not the best use of the platform. But I think there is that use in society, there is that use in museums and especially in galleries, et cetera. And especially also, you know, a younger generation that is much more um, embracing of digital technology. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that really gets at that question. Um, and there are a few more. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them um, on the chat, but this has been really tremendous in, in just a short span of time. So um, the last thing I'll say is thanks again, uh, Vanessa and Frank, for presenting this. Thanks for joining us here today. Um, that chat on Whova is available, so continue the conversation there. And um, I'll end this recording so that we can move on to other presentations here this week. Thanks, folks. Thank Take you, care. everyone. Thank you.